Welcome to um, the second IMAP Portfolio Management Conference. It's a pleasure for us um, to be able to have you join us here in Brisbane today. My name's Toby Potter, and um, it's almost exactly a year since we held our last live event here in Brisbane, um, just at the start of COVID. Who knew what the last 12 months would bring? It's um, it's a pleasure for us to be able to hold this event live. And so to those of you who are in the room and those who are joining us through the live streaming, welcome. Apologies for starting a little late. Um, this is a technology-driven process, need I say more. Um, today is actually you know, quite complex. We'll be streaming into the room um, a number of our presenters, as well as streaming the whole of today's session out to uh, 40 or 50 live streaming participants. So, um, so thank you very much for joining us here, here live. So um, before I hand over and introduce our, um, our MC for the day, Al Logan from Marcona Partners, um, Al will be known to many of you. Let me say a very brief word about upcoming events for us. One of the things we learned from COVID is the opportunities that Zoom offers to deal with a, um, an issue in depth. And you'll see on the screen a number of the webinar series that we'll be running through the first half of this year, each of them over three sessions to enable us to drill in depth into, into a particular topic. Uh, and then back to the advisor roadshows on the business of advice in May. So now, it's my pleasure to hand over to today's uh, MC, Al Logan. Al, as many of you will know, is the former GM of Godfrey Pembroke Limited um, and has deep experience in, in advice. Um, so please join with me in welcoming Al Logan. Well, thanks very much, Toby. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and good morning to those who are streaming. Um, we are running a little bit behind, so I'll, I'll get the housekeeping bits and pieces out of the way. And the first one is that it, it, we're in the world of QR codes. Here's our QR code. If you'd like to scan that, uh, you can download all of the presentations from today, uh, the agenda and speaker bios. So I'd, uh, you'll see this code many times over the course of the day, but I'd say get in there, get it done now. Uh, in terms of, uh, for those looking for some free Wi-Fi, uh, the QUT public Wi-Fi site is available. So if you do your Wi-Fi search, you can, you can uh, log on there for nothing. Uh, in terms of uh, just some housekeeping emergency exits, are behind us uh, on the, uh, the curtains, and also there's a set of stairs over near the lifts where you came in. Uh, should we have to vacate this beautiful premises? And I've got to say, Brisbane, you've turned it on. I'm from Melbourne. This is my second flight in 11 months, and it's just an absolute pleasure to be here. This is great. I can see some, some, some old friends in the room with, with some tans. You don't get tanned in Melbourne. This is great. Um, now, for those who have, have parked, um, there's some in, in the P block, uh, which is right next door. You can validate your parking ticket at the registration desk as well. Uh, and get it a lot cheaper, so I'd suggest you do that. Uh, and lastly, if you're looking for toilets, they're on level nine. We're on level 10, toilets are on level nine, just head down the stairs or, or take the lift. So I think that's it for, for housekeeping, but you'll see that QR code come through. And uh, look, I think uh, in terms of those who are, who are online and streaming, if you'd like to type in your questions, um, we're all used to that, aren't we? I mean, it's been a whole year of Zooming. Uh, I must admit, last week in Sydney, took about, took till after morning tea for, for people to warm up in the audience. And, I, and everyone, a few speakers were a little bit freaked out, quite frankly. They hadn't been in a room full of this many people for about a year. They'd been used to sitting in their shorts and their t-shirt, Zooming away, and you know, kind of had the anonymity of the screen between them and everyone else. But, it's great to have the energy here. We've got a whole, a whole series of very, very interesting presentations today, uh, focusing on the new normal. And, and so I'd encourage you, uh, for the panel sessions in particular, but even for, for, for all of the speakers, if you've got some questions, put your hand up. Let's have a conversation. We'll have roving mics. Uh, and can I ask for all the presenters, if you can speak into the microphone, and for, if you're asking questions, please 
you know, put your hand up, wait for the mic, and then, and then ask, ask your question, because otherwise the folks who are zooming in can't hear it, and the people in the room won't be able to hear it. And if you watch, you know, our politicians lately, if you, if you, you watch their, their sort of uh, press conferences, you know, invariably they do a great job when the microphone's there, and they'll have 20 minutes of questions. You can never hear the damn questions. So let's, let's make sure we do that properly. So our first session is on international shares. And uh, it's, a, it's a panel session. And uh, unfortunately, Matthew Jeremy uh, from Quilla uh, was a, a late withdrawal as our moderator, but we've had, we've had our own Amanda Munro from IMAP step in uh, to do this. And as she, Amanda has a, a long history in asset management. She's the founding partner of Arnhem Investment Management. Uh, before that, she was an Australian equities analyst at ABM AMRO, deep research experience. She's a certified financial analyst. She's got an MBA, and she's also got an undergraduate degree in vet science, so she can answer a range of questions for you today, whether it's international shares or anything else. Please welcome Amanda to the stage. Now, I've been told that I need to put this very close, so just for everyone that's speaking today. Um, is this the clicker? Yeah. Okay. Right, so I'm a late ring in, so you'll have to excuse me. I'm going to have to, to read this today. Uh, our first session is on international shares, and we have three very experienced practitioners to talk to you today. Um, first of all, we'll have Charles Stoddart from Zurich. Let me tell you a bit about Charles. He joined Zurich in 2015 and has been in financial services for 20 years. Um, prior roles included as an investment management, an investment analyst at Five Oceans Asset Management, a fund manager at Pagana Capital Asian Equities, and he was also at Perennial Investment Partners and Murray Johnson in Glasgow. He has a Master's in Modern History from St Andrews University in the UK and is a CFA charter holder. Next we will have Francine Moo present briefly from Frankl Franklin Templeton. Uh, she is a Vice President and Portfolio Manager and also a Generalist Research Analyst for Franklin, Temp Franklin Equity Group. Uh, prior to joining Franklin in 2008, she was a Senior Investment Management at Pictet Asset Management and a Vice President at Citigroup Asset Management covering financials. Uh, Francine entered the financial services industry in 2000, holds a BA and a Bachelor of Commerce Honours from the University of Melbourne, and she's a CFA charter holder. I told you they're all experienced. Uh, thirdly, and this is, this is um, the, the most experienced of all, is Monique Kotechka, who has been in, um, he's InSync's Chief Invest, fund, Investment Officer, and he has 30 years of funds management experience in international and Aussie equity markets. He's worked all over the place. Um, he's worked for seven years as a senior portfolio manager at Investment U Neutral and five years of BT Funds Management and three years of the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority. Uh, he, um, um, he was a senior portfolio manager of the Australian Share Fund at the Investors Mutual and a key member of the investment team and was... Uh, which was voted Fund Manager of the Year in 2002 and 2003. So um, you've got three very experienced practitioners here. They're going to explain briefly to you what their views are uh, in international equities standing at the beginning of 2021. I've had a look at all of their presentations and they're all taking a longer term view. And I think that's, um, I think that's a more useful way to look at equity. So we're not going to be looking at 2021. Um, it's not going to be all about vaccines and COVID. It's going to be more about the, the key mega drivers that are um, affecting um, international equity exposures um, over the longer term. Um, I think this is very helpful. I think sometimes um, people get quite caught up in the quarterly fluctuations of equities markets. And it takes a long time for these larger drivers to play out. Um, and, you know, rarely do they play out in a straight line either. So uh, let's take a bigger picture view today. Um, I encourage you all to ask questions from the three uh, presenters today, and we will have a question and answer session after their brief presentations. Um, the other thing I wanted to draw your attention to is YAP. A lot of them have quite good presentations um, with a, like some quite deep slides. And it's useful, I think, to um, be able to refer back to those um, later on um, 
and they'll also be on the IMAP website later on as well. So without further ado, can I please uh, ask Charles and Francine and Monique to come to the stage? All three of you, please. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I get to speak first. It's a sign of the times. Um, so at Zurich Investments, you may or may not know us that well, but we partner with a number of, um, a number of fund managers, a couple overseas and a couple domestically. And our longest relationship, which is about 20 years or so, now is with uh, a group called Lazard Asset Management, and they manage our global thematic strategies. So their starting point today is that this is a moment when thinking about the big picture really matters. Today there is an obsession with technology when you think about what's in investors' portfolios. We are coming out of a decade when the only game in town has been big cap tech, big cap growth, and based on the conversations we have, or that they have with thousands, literally thousands of company managements um, each year, we believe that it is likely that the direction of structural and secular change will become more complex over the next decade. So what are the other secular drivers that we think it's worth talking about? So when we meet corp company management, we ask the question, what are you spending money on uh, with a view to the next decade? What is important in terms of how you're going to be positioned in years three to 10? And that really drives the basis for these four secular drivers. So as well as technology, we also think geopolitics, monetary policy, and sustainability will be very important secular drivers over the next decade. So technology, we know it is and remains very important today, but it is becoming so much broader. There's been a convergence of te technological change, in advances in terms of big data, cloud computing, artificial intelligence. Now this represents a seismic change and it's beginning to hit the mainstream. Technology companies we know They've had their business models accelerated through COVID. Uh, they're doing incredibly well. They are discovering new avenues uh, for revenue generation. But we continually hear about slower moving industries that are adopting technology as well. And this is really around improving efficiency and productivity. I'll come back to that later. We think sustainability today has become mandatory. Awareness of sustainability is rising rapidly <clears throat> with a particular focus on providing solutions to key challenges, particularly, particularly with the environment. Now, regulation will evolve, and that's going to drive how these industries develop, uh, particularly with a, with a view to resource efficiency, um, energy efficiency. And that's really going to benefit companies that are standing in front of providing those solutions. And it's also going to provide um, <clears throat> or shine a light on bad actors, if you like. So we think that this is a re-evaluation of company societal license to generate a profit and is also a key structural driver that has to be taken into consideration. Within monetary policy, we believe that there is a strong case to be made today that the current form of monetarism is coming to an end. Now, monetary systems can last a long time. The current ones lasted about 40 years, but they don't last forever. They do end. And usually this occurs when unintended consequences really outweigh the benefits. And I think this is what we're starting to see today. There's perceptions of rising inequality, and that's one clear sign. And we've seen it uh, particularly in terms of assets becoming very big relative to the real economy. Um, and particularly when we think about how monetary policy is being combined with fiscal policy, it is really, it's almost as though it's been explicitly targeted at maintaining uh, the value of those assets. 
So this, this represents a form of moral hazard that may be hard to sustain, and it stokes perceptions of unfairness, particularly amongst those that don't own the assets which are going up. Uh, for market participants, very low interest rates have also exacerbated crowding into very, very small areas, um, in, particularly in long duration assets. And finally, geopolitics. So we understand, and this was particularly evident under Trump, maybe it's retreating a little bit, but that political cohesion is fraying at the national and the international level. So the intersection between politics and finance may be increasingly important in coming years. Now we know that Joe Biden has taken a step back, he's tried to reverse a number of what Trump's put in place, but we also understand that tensions between the US and China aren't going to go away, and we see that also uh, in, in our own situation. So this has important consequences for how co corporates think about their supply chains and how they think about their capex priorities. I want to just expand on this a little bit because, and you may not all be able to see that, um, but may maybe with Amanda's uh, direction we can, we can share the slides. So these secular drivers are important, but it's also the interactions and debates that happen within those which are, we think, increasingly important. For example, think about the uh, interaction between geopolitics and sustainability. So that might inform on future stimulus programs, and, and uh, Amanda's mentioned the stimulus program that's being passed in the US at the moment. Green New Deals are a clear example of where sustainability and geopolitics meet. Now, there's clear benefits to owning companies that stand in front of that allocation of capital, but we also need to be very mindful that money that pours into a, a theme or into a trend can, uh, or risks lowering uh, future returns. So this is something that we also need to be very mindful of. Um, when we think about the end of monetarism, we ha also have to think about what are the implications if there is a significant devaluation of fiat currencies. What are the stores of value that are going to stand the test of time through the next decade? And some of these long duration assets that I mentioned may not be that store of value. They can't all be priced as winners. Um, for Lazard, this global framework really represents the aggregation of those thousands of meetings that they have with companies and also their own in, in internal research. So it represents their view of the world. I know it's a little bit unusual. It probably needs to be 3D or, but it's a very simple view of the world. And it really encapsulates the bottom-up view of what, is, what matters over the next, is, or is likely to drive investment returns over the next three to 10 years. And it also helps guide theme creation. So each proprietary theme that Global Thematic puts together, Lazard puts together, must take this framework into account. In the Diversified Global Fund, they have about 11 themes, and I'm just gonna take you through one to provide a bit more of an example. And this one's called Asset Efficiency. So it's not the most exciting name, possibly, but it really does speak to the longer-term opportunity about harvesting efficiency gains. And, and I think it's, it's really helpful from a, from a number of points, points of view. So for those that can see in the top left, there's a series of arrows. Now what we believe is the next one to two years has been increasingly discounted. I mean, how many times have you heard about the Internet of Things? I mean, we, we've heard about it for over a decade now since Cisco coined the term. But what's the next step? Well, think of it this way. If you have a factory with 100 robots in it, and there's one robot that's more efficient than the other 99, what happens today is that data is fed back to central control. Now, it all seems to be very efficient. You have a team of data scientists come in, they pour over the findings, and they work out, after a period of time, how to make the factory floor 4 or 5% more efficient in the, in, in the next year. Okay, that's great. That's the Internet of Things. Everything's connected. But what is the next step? And the next step that we're understanding is when that one efficient robot can speak to the other 99 robots immediately in real time. So you get those efficiencies across the factory floor today, as opposed to having to wait uh, for a year or two. It takes out that humor, human interaction. Now, we've seen operating standards develop in the consumer space, and they are incredibly powerful. Think of Apple, think of Android. 
But what about in the broader industrial space? What about in housing? What about in door locks? I mean, there are any number of uh, items that you can point to that are developing operating software or operating standards that speak to that. So why, why is that relevant? Well, the real source of value in true automation doesn't necessarily lie in maybe cameras for smartphones or screens. These all seemed incredibly exciting back in 2007, 2008. It is really the operating standard that drives the core value. And there's only a few companies that can do that. So that speaks to the technology side. It ticks that secular driver. But it also ticks the sustainability theme, because what is really driving this is going to be improvement in energy efficiency. Uh, when governments think about regulation, when they think about encouraging companies to, me, to be more green, one of the first things that companies will look at is how they can improve the efficiencies of their buildings. So companies that can drive that operating standard, and here the automated efficiencies are when one building talks to another building in terms of, um, in terms of angles of solar panels or in terms of aircon or whatever it might be. But these are standards that are not really being thought about today, but which are being applied across broader industries. And the other benefit is that these are long cycle industries. These aren't a two year mobile phone operating standard. These are 20, 30 year um, operating standards. So very, very powerful uh, themes. Um, in, terms of, in terms of geopolitics, well yes, these may well be beneficiaries of some of the stimulus programs that come through. And finally, when you're thinking about monetary policy, do they have a store of value? Well, absolutely. Think about the stores of value that are the likes of Apple or Google today. These are $2 trillion companies. These operating standards are not being priced for that. Now, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll just wind it up there. So when I'm talking about these long secular drivers, I think it, it is so important to uh, be thinking in that longer term, that three to 10 years. There are a number of fund managers that do it very well thinking about the short term, but what about the long term? If you think that the next decade is gonna continue to be dominated by tech, just go out and buy a NASDAQ ETF. It's far cheaper, I can promise you, than, than, than some of these uh, uh, global, um, growth managers. But if you think that the world is about to get more complex, if you think, or if you, uh, like me, believe that these secular drivers are gonna become more important in the investment world, then you need to make a choice. Do you go for areas of the market which are currently unloved? Or do you think about managers that can include this, these secular drivers into their, into their investment process? Um, Global Thematic likes to present themselves as the third way. Uh, we always like to have a little angle. Um, but in terms of companies that can speak to the growth opportunity over the next decade, but without doing it through a very, very concentrated areas of the market. Um, I'll leave it there and I'll hand over to Francine. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Hope you've managed to sort of uh, get a cup of coffee. Otherwise, I'm going to shake things up a bit. Uh, <laughs> but thanks very much for having me today. It, I'm, you know, delighted to be here in Brisbane. It's the first flight in um, a very long time. Um, so, as I mentioned, Amanda mentioned, um, I manage the global, um, well, Franklin Global Growth um, Fund alongside my colleague Don Huber, who some of you may have met before. And the way we view investments is. Oh, I'm sort of waiting for the slides to catch up, but, uh, <laughs> oh, sorry, that's my fault. Um, okay, is that not working? Oh, okay, so, yes, we own tech, but, you know, sometimes, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, okay, so here we go. Um, so the way we view investments is very simple, um, you know, we run a bottom-up, research-driven um, strategy. We have 35 to 40 names. So really, we like to find the idea, the best ideas to populate um, a portfolio. Um, we're benchmark indifferent, 
And, you know, as Amanda mentioned, you know, we have a very long-term investment horizon, you know, three to five years. Uh, but our typical holding period is around four years plus. And in some cases, uh, you know, we've, we have owned, you know, some stocks for more than, you know, 10 years. Um, from a risk management point of view, we try to select companies whose earnings streams are not highly correlated. So, you know, and this results basically in a diversified portfolio. So, for example, um, you know, we own this company called Tal Education Group in, in China, which is an after-school tutoring company. Um, and there's a, you know, great competitor called New Oriental um, Education in China as well. Uh, we wouldn't own both of them in the same portfolio because we think by owning both of them, we would double up on the risk. So we're really trying to create a best ideas portfolio without doubling up on that sort of economic overlap and the risk there. Um, yeah, and we can essentially do this because our process leads us down the market cap spectrum, which means that we like, you know, single line businesses or businesses w with one to three um, lines. Um, because, you know, as an analyst and looking at, you know, these companies from a modelling point of view, it's much easier to model and to sort of understand the levers available to management, um, you know, and, and to hold them account to, you know, what they're trying to do in terms of creating value for us as shareholders. Um, lastly, our hunting ground is global. Um, we can search without borders. Uh, we have an average allocation to emerging markets of less than 10% uh, of 20%. But um, you know we typically hold um, you know a, an allocation of around you know 10% levels. So you know really bottom up research driven 35 to 40 names best ideas um, long term investment horizon you know we're really trying to find those names with which are underpinned with strong secular growth drivers um, and from a risk management point of view we're not trying to sort of um, we're trying to diversify across broad sectors um, to ensure that you know that the economic correlations are, not, uh, are limited uh, within our portfolio so that if one stock falls it doesn't cascade through the rest of the portfolio um, and lastly, you know, we're global um, in terms of our hunting ground. And so, you know, you know, we own, you know, uh, names in emerging markets, which, you know, provide um, good circular growth drivers as well. So how has the market fared over this crisis period? Um, I think this chart is actually quite interesting um, insofar as um, it would appear that the market is trending along the same lines of the SARS period um, and, you know, um, rather than the dot-com bubble or, you know, the global financial crisis. Um, I think the pandemic has resulted, uh, well, has resembled more of a natural disaster um, and has created about half as much of the structural unemployment as the GFC. Um, and it's probably fair to say that consumers um, are better equipped to weather, you know, the storm this time. Uh, balance sheets are better. Um, the fiscal stimulus has also supported consumer spending. Um, and as re economies recover um, and the pent-up demand normalises, the question is, um, does this continue and what of valuations? Well, if we look at the cyclical um, adjusted PEs, um, valuations look like they've gone up. However, not to the extent um, that we saw during the dot-com period. Um, you know, certainly in the US, uh, where there's a higher weighting towards um, tech, um, the relative PE is higher than, you know, in, compared to other geographies. Um, but Overall, I think the profitability of you know tech companies is better than during the dot com period. Um, so you know we still find that you know valuation is still support supportive, and it really it speaks to sort of um, fundamental research in order to sort of uncover those names um, you know over time. Again, looking at the spread of the S and P five hundred forward earnings yield to um, the U S ten year real benchmark bond yield. Um, which is the data point actually that the Fed um, refers to, um, valuations are looking, you know, slightly above that sort of 24-year um, median. However, you know, it's still within the range, I think, in terms of the long-term average relative to bonds. 
There certainly has been a lot of bifurcation in the market. You know, media headlines all point to sort of high tech valuations or, you know, high valuations within the consumer discretionary sector. But, you know, our view is that basically active management will be key. Um, going forward and it's you know the ability of you know the bottom-up strategy the research driven strategies act um, to, to uncover these names and to sort of continue to find um, you know opportunities going forward over the, over the long term so you know you can see on this chart that basically you've got you know Alibaba Alphabet Amazon Facebook Microsoft uh, the large caps there there has been a lot of I mean I guess increasing con con concentration in terms of the indices but also so in terms of, you know, the funds available within the global, uh, global equity space. So what are these stocks? Well, I'm going to talk to you now about two um, stocks that we hold in the portfolio, uh, which have strong secular growth drivers that we like um, and we think will continue to grow over the next three to five years. So this first company is Intuitive. Um, it's an $86 billion um, stock company based in the US. Um, and they have very strong market shares in terms of uh, facilitating um, robotic surgery. So they make the Da Vinci um, surgical systems. And we think overall that basically penetration of robotic surgeries will increase over time. We're starting to see this in um, urology and the opportunity is vast in terms of being able to penetrate general surgery and other types of surgery. So you can sort of see, you know, over time, the number of um, robotic um, surgeries performed has increased, you know, in 2011 from about, you know, 300 to, you know, close to 1,000. Um, they've got an installed base at the moment of, of 6,000, um, you know, surgical systems out there around the world. Um, and, you know, we continue to see interest from, you know, hospitals in order to sort of placing orders um, going forward to, to um, you know, facilitate um, the increase in robotic surgeries. Robotic surgeries is an area that is interesting because the investment thesis is really it's going to save on healthcare costs. You know, you think about these, the smaller incisions, the lower blood loss, the shorter hospital stays, um, and the you know increased recovery rate. Um, you know, that all lends itself to sort of increasing penetration. Um, you can also see that you know with laparoscopic, laparoscopic surgeries um, that are done at Medtronic uh, within their minimally invasive. Um, you know, segment uh, that the US accounts for only 43% and, you know, the opportunity to penetrate overseas is, you know, for in, in, intuitive is much higher and will continue over time. So, you know, it's it's a name which we like, obviously, in the COVID period, um, you know, you've seen electri elective surgeries drop off, um, but we saw that as an opportunity to build a position in this company. Um, and, you know, since then, you've sort of seen China pick up, Japan, um, the US and Germany are a bit behind. But, you know, going forward, we see good opportunity for, for that to continue and to penetrate further. So we, we this is a name that we like. Um, you know, it has 70% recurring revenues um, and very strong margins and, and free cash flow. So um, it's, it's a name that is supported by strong secular growth drivers. Um, just moving on quickly because I'm conscious of time. Another story we like is CoStar Group. Um, it has 30 years of commercial real estate data um, in the US and it facilitates transactions. Now we know that, you know, over time, you know, the real estate um, sector during COVID has been under pressure. Um, and so, you know, this is the company that you go to if you want to sell or buy a um, commercial real estate property. Um, you draw upon that data and basically, you know, you need it in order to understand, you know, uh, the market, the vacancy rates, leasing, tenancy, and also the prices in which, um, you know, uh, you can sort of offer um, in order to enact a transaction. So it's a name that we like. We think the digitization of commercial real estate, um, you know, is still in the early stages stages uh, in, in the US and this this name is the one to own um, to sort of play that um, secular growth driver going forward. So I'm conscious of the time um, and I'll hand it over to Monique but you know bottom up stock picking, um, concentrated portfolios, active management will be key going forward. <coughs> Thank you. 
Good morning. It's uh, an absolute pleasure to come across and have the opportunity to come across the border again. In fact, I was just recently here with my family and uh, look, having been 12 months away from uh, the Sunshine State, we just, uh, it, was, it was an absolute delight. So happy to be back again. I was only there two weeks ago, so uh, and welcome everybody. Um, so uh, in an environment where <coughs> in an environment where there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty uh, around the shape of the economic recovery, you know, is it a V-shaped recovery? Is it a K-shaped recovery? You know, what does the vaccinations mean? MMT. Um, you know, it's very difficult to work out how to position the portfolio for the short term. There's just so many variables. And we believe that there is a better way, you know, um, there is a more certain way of delivering really strong returns for investors, and we do believe that's around duration investing. So, uh, you know, rather than, uh, you know, trying to position the portfolio for the short term, um, you know, duration investing is really about investing in businesses in the longer term. And if you think about it, that's actually in line with most of your clients' uh, time frame and liabilities. Uh, so from our perspective, it, there's a much better match there. And the way we think about duration investing is we invest in 30 highly profitable companies across uh, 18 megatrends. So megatrends, uh, that's the core focus for us. You know, why do we invest in megatrends? Because uh, they're really long-term in nature, highly durable and unstoppable. So you can almost set your watch by it. So if you think about, uh, you know, the rapidly aging population around the world, the shift to digital payments, uh, or the aggressive drive towards health and wellness, well, you know, economic cycles and pandemics don't actually impact them. I mean, in fact, in some instances, it's actually accelerated those megatrends. So we believe that investing in megatrends actually provides a much more certain uh, way of investing um, than thinking about economic cycles. Um, sorry, I'm just... Uh, so if you think about... If you look at the megatrends on the chart here, so I'm just a little bit lost here with my glasses. If you look at the megatrend chart here, we, we've invested in 18 megatrends. Uh, and as I said, we've got 30 companies across those 18 megatrends. And I just wanted to touch on a few because quite often when you think about megatrends, you think about technology, okay? And anyone keeps saying, well, you know, if you think about technology and, dis and, and disruption, um, uh, they sort of go hand in hand. And so from our perspective, we, we've invested in a lot of megatrends that are non-tech in nature. And this provides a really powerful source of diversification. So just to touch on a few here, so we've got the age-related health solutions. So that obviously ties in with the aging of the population. And so, you know, a good exposure there is immuno-oncology drugs. And if you look at cancer, cancer is still one of the fastest growing diseases globally. Uh, think about video gaming. Well, if you think about the size of the video gaming market today, everyone thinks about the movie industry and the uh, music industry, where the, where the video gaming industry today is larger than the movie and the music industry combined, and it's growing at high single digits in terms of growth rates. Um, there are 600 million people moving into the middle class in India, and that's already adding, already adding to the large number of middle class people in China that we're seeing today. So all of these, this, this movement of people is driving really strong growth in the demand for skincare and high-end cosmetics and really fueling the beauty global megatrend. So when we're looking at durable growth, sustainable megatrends, it's not only about technology. You know, you can get a lot more exposure outside of technology, and that's what we're seeking to do. Another attractive aspect of investing in these companies, they're highly innovative. Okay? They spend a large chunk, typically 40 to 50% of their retained earnings, investing in innovation. So if you think about how do I maintain a competitive edge in this environment, you can't just sit there and buy back your shares and pay dividends. I know that's all really attractive. The way to really drive growth is to invest in the business and invest into these runways of growth. So these are highly innovative companies, and they're on the right side of disruption as a result of that. And this is what delivers sustainable growth in the businesses that we own in the portfolio. So over the, over the longer term, um, 
it's really re consistent earnings growth that really drives strong share price appreciation. And this is why we seek to invest in highly profitable companies that are benefiting from the sustainable growth that's available to them through those mega trends. And I mentioned profitable because there's always a lot of focus on trends, and, and that is important. Mega trends are very important, but you've got to find highly profitable businesses that can reinvest into those trends and generate healthy returns. And the way we measure profitability is through return on invested capital. So if you look at the average return on invested capital across our portfolio, it sits at 50%. That's five times the market average. The average across the market is 10%. So our portfolio is five times the market average. And they continue to reinvest 40 to 50%, generating similar sort of returns into that runway of growth. So these are massive compounding businesses. And what the megatrends does is it gives us that certainty, right? It gives these businesses the certainty. They know the runway is available, so they can keep on reinvesting at really high rates. Other benefits of, of the duration approach is that uh, uh, Quite often, the performance of our portfolio of these stocks can't be explained by style, industry, or market factors. They're actually quite independent of it. So we're not making sector allocations and industry allocations. It's actually the mega trends that are taking into those markets and into those sectors, and actually provides a very di uh, different return profile. Um, to be a sustainable growth company of the future, you have to be or companies have to be very aware of ESG factors. Customers are increasingly buying products and services based on values and ESG factors, okay? They, they're, and they're shunning away from products that aren't positive in that nature. So implicit in our process, because we're looking to buy sustainable businesses, is a strong ESG uh, aspect. And if you actually look at the portfolio in terms of metrics, the, the portfolio actually ranks very strongly both across ESG and carbon intensity. And that's really positive in terms of going forward. So the result of this is, is that uh, the result of duration investing in buying these portfolio of stocks is, oh, sorry, I'm not, apologies for that. Um, <laughs> it has been over a year since I presented, so. Uh, <laughs> um, so, the, so the, adv the advantage of this is that you do actually have a portfolio that actually does consistently perform through the cycle with much, level lo much lower levels of volatility. Now, this is a chart that actually compares in sync with, a, with our peer group. You know, there's about 25 managers on this chart. And what it measures is the correlation of excess returns of the in sync portfolio versus our peer group. And you notice there, if you just follow the red line down, that the average excess correlation is 0.2. So quite often, investors go, well, you're just a growth manager, and I've got a bucket of growth managers out there, and you're all sort of looking to do the same thing, and you must have a similar portfolio with similar results. Well, no. Now, there are differences, and what this shows is there is a difference in terms of investing in megatrends versus other growth strategies. It actually does provide very powerful blending opportunities. Okay. Most of the performance that comes through investing using a duration megatrend approach is actually idiosyncratic in nature. So what that basically means, it mostly comes through stock picking. There's very little um, returns that are actually being generated from market timing. You know, how much cash shall I own? You know, shall I suddenly go defensive and buy a bunch of utilities because I'm feeling a bit nervous about markets? No, mo most of the returns actually comes through stock picking. And I think that's what's really attractive about this approach. So this will be a trend that's probably very close to Amanda's heart, uh, the pet humanization global mega trend. And so what's happening is that we're now increasingly treating pets as part of the family. In fact, a recent survey uh, actually showed that 90% of the respondents actually considered pets to be an integral part of the family. And you've got to, you know, the reasons why are very obvious. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a need for connection and nurturing. Okay, and that, that's sort of the, the dominant human behavioral bias uh, driver that's actually that's actually uh, behind the mega trend. The mega trend uh, uh, growth rates, if you look at the mega trend's growth rates over the last 10 years, it's been growing at multiples of GDP, 9 to 10 percent. And if, if, if anything, COVID has actually accelerated the global mega trend. So that mega trend's in place for a while, and COVID has actually lifted the growth rates there. If you look at the bottom part of the chart here, 
what it shows is what are the different generational cohorts looking to spend on pets going forward. And what's really interesting here is actually the Gen Zers. They are the first generation of children that consider pets to be like humans, okay? And they are looking to spend the most amount of money going forward on pet nutrition and pet health care. So if you think about the demographics and as they're getting older and that is what they're looking to do, there's a really powerful demographic tailwind that's going to keep pushing them forward. So there's a high level of certainty, again, around the future growth of companies that are exposed to the megatrends. And the stock we own here is Zoetis. Okay? It, Zoetis is a leader in animal nutrition and medication to the pet and animal healthcare industry. And we've owned a highly profitable company, very high returns on invested capital, reinvest a large part of its profits to come, keep on coming up with new products and services. And we've had, we've had the benefit of owning this stock for five years, okay? You know, we didn't have, because the mega trend has been in place, and yet we believe it will continue to be in place, and the stock has effectively doubled over the last five years, and we still see a lot of potential going forward. So by way of conclusion, um, we believe duration of mega trend investing actually provides more consistent and certain outcomes in a very uncertain world. Uh, provides very powerful diversification benefits that actually blends with other portfolio managers and other fund manager styles, and also really fits with the liabilities and I think the, uh, uh, you know, the duration that most investors look at when they're thinking about investing in equity markets. So with that, I'd like to thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Um, I do have quite a few questions uh, that we were going to discuss, but um, because we are running a little bit behind time, I thought I would. Is that? Yeah. Try that. I thought I, I thought I'd ask if um, there were any questions yeah. from the floor. Right. Uh, Toby, Toby's got the mic here. Um, yep. So, Monique, for the last presentation, just what is um, UB... Closer. To two of the um, megatrends I, I didn't understand from their title, UBI and premiumisation. Uh, thanks for the question. So, UBI is basically universal basic income. So, universal basic income isn't widespread, but it's been something that's been actively debated, and, and it's largely because we've seen um, uh, that there's been a... Uh, a widening gap between the rich and the poor, and the whole middle class has been hollowed out. Okay, so if you think about that, you know, as your wages go down, you become much more conscious about value. You know, when you go and purchase goods and services, you're much more conscious about how much you're paying for it. Uh, and we, you know, it's an unfortunate outcome of post GFC, and, and obviously you can see the record unemployment levels. We believe that that trend will continue to be in place. So, you know, we own one of the leading highly profitable discount stores in the US that's benefiting from that unfortunate trend. Uh, and that company, again, interestingly, you know, it's got a, uh, uh, if you look at the next 10 years, they can increase their stores by 50%. And through COVID, they actually had very high single, in fact, high double digit volume growth. And that just shows you the pattern of how consumers were spending. Uh, Premiumization is basically the fact that everybody wants to, uh, if they can, aspire towards buying uh, products that are slightly more valued. It's a little bit different, uh, but beautification is, is a good example. So Estee Lauder, for example, uh, is benefiting from the skincare and cosmetics megatrend. And I mentioned about the beauty megatrend. But also, uh, particularly, well, it's already happened in Europe, but even if you look at emerging markets, um, there's a, des there's a desire there to buy premium products, and that's where it stays positioned. It's, that's our portfolio stock. Uh, it's very much at the premium end of the cosmetics market. Um, so premiumization is the fact that uh, you know, uh, consumers aspire uh, uh, to buy uh, better quality products if they can afford to do so. Other questions? Um, I, I have a question, which is that... Um, uh, 
I mean, we're, we're currently operating in an interest rate environment, um, uh, you know, bouncing along the bottom. In one of the slides from Sydney showed that these are the lowest interest rates um, in human history. There was a slide reaching back to 3000 BC. Um, uh, so I wonder if, if, if each of you would comment briefly on y your own view about um, the role of this level of, of interest rates and, and secondly, your concerns, if any, about interest rate rises. Okay, thank you, Toby. Well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll kick off. I think one of the things that we've seen um, in COVID is that it has been very much a shared experience. So we've had shocks before, but I think this is probably one of the first times when the COVID experience in Australia, maybe not Australia, but maybe UK, US, when you talk about COVID, everyone understands what you mean. And it's provided, it's provoked a very, very strong uh, fiscal monetary response uh, because of that sort of shared experience. And I think when you think about the lessons that came out of the GFC where they tended to underestimate the systemic risks. What you've had this time around is a very deliberate shock and awe type approach to, uh, to try and get the economy up and running, and I think that's been uh, noted. Now, the risk is that the, the pressure to have more stimulus programs is, is high, and particularly in the US, there's an appetite to do that. And the appetite is really driven by this inequality that you've seen emerge. Um, I mean, I think the risk that you have today is how much is enough? How much stimulus program do you need to get people back on their feet? When is it become inflationary? So I'm not about to suggest or talk to, I mean, there may well be inflation blips through this year. This, we, we, we know well that oil was negative a year ago. It's now 60 bucks, so there's going to be an inflation pulse because of that. But, and I don't think anyone is seriously suggesting that inflation is going to be an immediate problem. But I think you, we have to uh, prepare ourselves that we may be at the end of a 40-year period of deflation. That may well have run its course. And if we see these programs... Um, that drive inflation back into the real economy, which every stimulus program to date has really benefit assets more than the real economy. But if you see, start to see those stimulus programs come back into the real economy, then you have to start factoring in the risk of inflation at some point over the next few years. I think from our point of view, um, you know, as Toby mentioned, you know, interest rates have been low for a very long time. I think, you know, markets can absorb, you know, an increasing, a gradual increase, you know, level. Um, and, you know, we we'll are remain watchful, um, you know, over, you know, the, the next week, I guess, in terms of the next data points. Um, I think, you know, as Charles mentioned, it's been an uneven recovery. There's obviously a lot of pent up demand. Um, and in terms of employment, you know, there has been sort of, um, you know, mixed recovery in terms of, you know, um, different parts of the, um, you know, the employment sector. So in terms of, you know, low income workers versus, you know, um, middle income to high income, you know, the recovery is kind of sparse there or differentiated. And so we really have to sort of uh, continue to watch that closely. But I think, you know, equity markets can absorb, you know, a gradual increase in terms of, you know, interest rates over time. It's been so low for so long. Uh, in terms of the environment we're in at the moment, yes, interest rates are at record lows, but I think there's an important distinction between inflation and reflation. Um, and as the uh, US Fed governor basically said, you know, he doesn't think inflation is imminent, but he thinks real GDP growth is increasing, and that's not surprising because we're coming out of a, a very deep recession. So you'd expect growth to increase and inflation to increase, and this has obviously been reflected in you know, bond yields selling off a little bit in the short term, that's expected. Uh, but you know, as Francine said, you know, a little bit of inflation, a bit more inflation and, and certainly real GDP growth is actually really positive for markets longer term. Uh, and in the very long term, you know, valuations are supported if, if inflation sits below that 
around the two percent level. We're not there yet, okay? And that's actually the sweet spot for sweet spot for equity markets. But what that actually shows is there is some pricing power, some some inflation in the system, but you're actually getting some decent growth in that period. It's almost like the late '90s when we had a similar experience back then. So there is obviously some risks around policies um, and its impact on, on a potential inflation outbreak and higher interest rates, and something you've got to be watchful for. But there are also some secular headwinds around technology and and obviously. Uh, uh, very high levels of unemployment, et cetera, that's keeping inflation in check as well. So uh, so that would be our view. And, and again, I think that's very supportive about taking a longer term view. Are there any other questions? It's always at the other end of the room. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm Lisa from Bridges Bayside. Just, um, I've noticed all three of you were talking a lot about perceptions of inequality um, and the rising gap between the rich and the poor. Do you think that um, the trend for um, environmental awareness and some of the regulatory policies we're seeing around the world, like promises to, um, for example, dump um, um, fuel cars and things like that um, in favor of electric vehicles, which obviously is going to be difficult to implement at all levels of society. Do you think some of these trends will actually drive that gap further or wider? Thanks. Great question. Um, it, it is an excellent question and probably requires quite a level of deep thinking. It's, it's probably quite complex. Look, I'm, I'm really positive, actually, about the future because we've had a disruptive shock to the global system. This is just COVID. We've all had to adapt. Every industry, every sector has had to adapt to changing technology. And, and you know, you know companies, like, companies like General Electric, the largest company in the world, has struggled to adapt, OK? The share price is languishing for a reason. It may recover a bit, but they haven't transitioned, OK? So everyone's going through this change. But I do believe that, that a lot of these uh, technologies and investments into the environment and, 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 you know, you've seen Biden, for example, talking about, you know, investing a lot more in, in green energy and, and et cetera. That's going to create a lot of jobs in the process over time. So as we start reskilling and moving in that direction, I'm actually really optimistic about the future. I don't, you know, it's always dark as, you know, b b b before the sun and the sunshine comes out and, and I'm of that ilk. I really think that there's a lot of positive changes that, that are happening. And the other thing is companies are under enormous pressure to do the right things now. Okay, enormous. I think we've hit a tipping point there. And this is about buying sustainable growth companies of the future. And those companies understand uh, that regulation is coming, customer uh, preferences are changing, and you really need to be positioned for that. So they, these companies are investing heavily in those areas, and you, you, know, you need people to do that. So I'm, uh, uh, I'm a little bit more optimistic that things will start to improve on that front. I think it will be sort of gradual. Um, certainly, you know, we own a company named, you know, Aptiv, which provides the neural networks into cars. Um, you know, for electrification of vehicles and things like that. But I think it's difficult, you know, it'll be a gradual shift, um, but I think it's difficult um, in terms of mandating, you know, the change to, you know, electric vehicles, you know, um, in a sort of quick manner. I think it'll take time for the industry to sort of digest um, and also the consumer, the end consumer, as you mentioned, you know, affordability and things like that. So, um, you know, it, we're, we're watchful of that trend. Um, we certainly have exposure to electrification of vehicles um, and, and things like that. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, it's driven by markets and, and, you know, mandating or regulation, you know, to sort of encourage that is obviously there, but it's not going to be a full sort of one or the other. Okay, well, just very briefly, um, and, and I don't want to um, reiterate everything that's been said, which I think is well, well considered. It's a, really good, it's a really good question, and, and I think it then comes down to, uh, could it get wider? Of, of, of course it could. Um, hopefully it doesn't in, in terms of the in, inequality, but I think it then comes back to this um, uh, pressure on elected officials, particularly in democracies, um, to you know, politicians love to spend money, um, but they need they need public support to do that. 
And I think targeting inequalities is one way that they can address that, whether it's in the environmental sphere, um, whether it's in terms of universal uh, wages, um, whether it's in terms of MMT or, or, or some, other, some other factor. But I think there is a more determined push to, to have a look at those inequalities. And it may just be some of the regulation that you see in some of these large cap tech. Um, it's not the Wild West frontier anymore. People are being called to account uh, for some of these business models. Well, we could go on for another half an hour on some of these, these trends that we're discussing. It's quite interesting, but the metaphorical cane is coming in from stage left, so uh, we'll have to uh, leave it there, and uh, these three presenters will be at morning tea, if you want to talk to them then. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll keep going and we'll actually uh, cut into morning tea somewhat to make sure that everyone gets a chance because I think there were some really excellent, uh, excellent themes that came through in that first presentation. I took a, quite a few notes and I was, I'm always interested in megatrends and I think it's really critical for those who are streaming online but also those in the room you know, have a think about what you want to get out of today. Why are you here? What do you want to get out of today? And if, and I think the, the first three presenters um, gave a, an awful lot of rich information uh, that, that could stimulate some interesting conversations back in the office with your team or with your clients. And I'm still trying to reconcile the need for connection and nurturing being pet well-being and humanization with robotic surgery and so they don't all completely align but I think there's there's something there for everyone and now we're going to go on to our, our next presentation again some some equally interesting themes and that is the role of real assets and infrastructure in a portfolio uh, moderated by by Greg Pease my old colleague from Godfrey Pembroke good to see you mate uh, Greg's uh, we're actually in his his alma Marta. He originally did an accounting and law uh, double degree here. Uh, he's had over 20 years experience uh, in, in our industry, uh, having, having worked uh, originally as an accountant at a leading advice firm. He's worked his way through a range of, of asset management uh, roles. He, along the way, he decided that he'd, he'd better become a chartered financial analyst, so he's worked very hard. And he's now a, a founder and partner at Evidentia, which is a, an asset consultant that's doing really great things. So without further ado, please welcome our moderator, Greg Pease. Thanks, Alan. Um, you know, I did actually come to uni here in the kind of early 90s, but I was actually, I couldn't find this building and I was looking under. They've got their own restaurants now. It's just, it's, it's, uh, it's unbelievable what uni students are like these days. Um, thanks, Alan. Yeah, as, as uh, Alan alluded to, we work together at, at Godfrey Pembroke. And for those that don't know Godfrey Pembroke that well, it's kind of NAB always viewed it as, you know, the, the ultra high net worth type advisors. It was a really good, uh, a good place to work. And, and the good thing that NAB actually did is it would actually let Godfrey Pembroke do a little bit more, uh, have a little bit more flexibility in the advice process. Um, and that's where, I think it was five or six years ago, um, it was my kind of introduction to managed accounts. Um, I was working with, uh, it was the biggest GPL firm there at the time, and um, we just didn't know too much about managed accounts. Like, they had their own MDA, and we did this whole program of work to go, well, what are the options here? What are SMAs? How does this work? What will this mean for the business? You know, kind of efficiencies, ROAs. Um, and it was a little bit of a light bulb moment for us because when we sat down with the directors, we went, we think a lot of the industry is actually going to go this way. And, you know, as I say, that was kind of five, six years ago. Um, and the industry really has come a long way um, uh, since then. Uh, my role today is just to um, moderate this next session, as Alan said, uh, just about the role of real assets uh, and infrastructure in portfolios. 
Um, and I'm joined today with uh, two kind of expert speakers that, that will be able to talk to each of their uh, asset classes. Um, and I'll introduce them uh, just in a second. So w when we view, uh, when Evidentia views asset, uh, real assets, and you know, real assets is a very broad category. So if we look at all the different asset classes, real assets is the one that really springs out to us as massive COVID winners and losers. Like if we think about, you know, what are the drivers on infrastructure versus property, office property, retail property, it's, it's really hard as we sit here today. Um, you've got some structural issues in both of the asset classes. So if we look at property, you know, we look at the Zoom effect, as a few people have already said. I mean, we're not used to speaking at conferences. I'm usually at the end of a Zoom. Uh, we actually run a lot of our investment committees via Zoom over the past year, and we've got you know, clients in Perth, Adelaide, kind of everywhere. So you've got the Zoom effect really affecting office, um, and you've got, you know, call it the Amazon effect starting to impact retail. I mean, clearly that hasn't rolled out in Australia yet, but uh, we get the sense that it's kind of coming. So you have these kind of structural challenges at the same time that, you know, when we look at here today, A-REITs, the one-year number just to... Uh, to the end of February two days ago, A REITs are still down 11.33%, uh, where equities, Australian equities, the All Lords is up 9.9.5%. You know, so, you know, at least today, the assets are quite cheap and you're compensated for that. Um, and then, you know, just to get really topical, I mean, this has only really come up in the last two weeks, but you've, you know, you have questions around. Uh, you know, infrastructure, property, are they bond proxies? You know, will interest rates go up and kind of affect them? Very similar to uh, Toby's question. Uh, and then, you know, we probably haven't had too many questions around inflation for a while, um, but that's starting to pop up in the last two weeks as well. So are they inflation hedge assets? Are they really good at doing that job? So I think it's a really topical kind of uh, session. Uh, how are we going to run this session? I'm going to introduce uh, both the speakers. Uh, and then we have a little, um, what do you call it, fireside chat Q&A kind of organised uh, through, to, through to morning tea. Um, so without further ado, the first speaker, I think Stephen, you, you're up first. So he's introducing Stephen Hayes. So Stephen is uh, responsible for the management of, of the global property securities team at First Centia. So prior to First Centia... Um, you know, Stephen's had, had plenty of roles. Prior to First Centia, he was with uh, Perennial Real Estate for six plus years, and before that, he was uh, with First Centia as well, so he must like the place. Um, without further ado, I'll just introduce Stephen, and um, I'll talk to you in the, uh, after his session. Uh, thank you, Greg, and good morning to all. It's a um, pleasure to present to you today. Um, so today uh, I'm going to be talking about real assets, but with a focus on real estate. And I'll start by giving a little bit of a little bit of background um, on ourselves before focusing on the real estate uh, sector characteristics, and then finally on the investment opportunity. Have I done something wrong here? Got it. No worries. Thank you. So, First Centre Real Estate Securities, we are an active manager. Um, we focus on investing in high quality real estate in the world's most bustling cities right around the globe. Uh, we look, seek to allocate capital to its most efficient use into those real estate assets we believe are going to offer the most compelling risk adjusted return. At any one point in time, we focus on absolute and through the cycle returns. We seek to preserve and grow our clients' capital. With regards to our foundational strengths, uh, you know, responsible investing means different things to different people and there's many different views um, on responsible investing. We take it very seriously and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a tick. We've got a rigorous defined uh, investment processes process that has delivered superior to returns across decades. Like I said, we focus on the preservation of capital and that leads to strong downside capture uh, within our investment portfolios and we carry materially lower finance risk than both the market and our peers. The team, uh, I head the team up. 
Well, there's 11 of us. We're a very senior team. We're located in Sydney, London and New York. We've got our average industry experience, you can see there, of over 18 years. Our experience crosses decades, it crosses economic cycles. So just on to responsible investing, like I said, we take it very seriously. Responsible investing considerations have been fully ingrained into our investment process for over a decade. We believe that this lowers investor risks and increases investor returns, and I'll just run through that now. The real estate sector is at the forefront of ESG adoption. Through the repositioning, modernisation of portfolios, through redevelopment and development, these investment portfolios, these assets, are becoming much more efficient than what we've seen in the past. The new technologies that are coming through are making a true difference. So through things like design, orientation to the sun, thermal mass, modern plant and equipment such as HVAC systems, that's heating, cooling and air conditioning systems, smart metering and sensor technologies, these buildings are becoming materially more efficient than older style buildings. In fact, if you take an ultra-modern office building, the amount of carbon it would emit can be up to 50% less than a like-type older building, to give you an idea of the materiality of the, difference of, of the differences that are being made. And it is the professional landlords that have got the access to capital that can and the expertise that can redevelop and reposition these portfolios to be extraordinarily efficient. And that process has been taking place on nigh, nigh on five years now. It's continuing and accelerating uh, as we speak. With regards to social considerations, these are bringing benefits to broader society. This is often overlooked. People don't really consider these things, but believe me, times are changing. And it's the broader society that's benefiting from these considerations. With regards to corporate governance, much greater scrutiny on boards these days. We've got more diversity on boards, we've got more experience, less director entrenchment, uh, and the alignment of interest between investors and the corporates is improving. In fact, if I look at first history, it's never been higher uh, than today. And I think it's only this focus is only going to increase into the future. So if you think about all those considerations, what it means for investors simply means lower risk. It's a win-win for everybody. The investors win, the corporates win with their share prices going up over time, and we benefit the environment. I thought this would be an interesting uh, chart to put in. So this is the fund's returns, right? So this is net of all fees since inception. We launched the fund in May 2016, sorry, May 2004. This is 16 year track record that we have built. And there's a couple of things I want to highlight with regards to this chart. Real estate creates wealth over the longer term. These are low risk assets, right? They're cash flow stable assets. They shouldn't generate high returns in short periods of time. They're just simply not risky assets. And you can see what happened between 2004 and 2007. After fees, the fund delivered 180% odd in three years. That's stupid. That's ridiculous. That was too hot. That shouldn't have happened. They were crazy times. They were extraordinarily t um, bizarre times. And you can see post the Lehman's announcement, the subsequent sell-off that occurred. The only reason that sell-off was as extreme as it was is because the run-up was as extreme as it was. If you look to normalise the GFC and you, you follow that trend line up, it actually flattens out and, and on a nice slope going up. So if you originally invested in the fund back as, at its inception, you've tripled your wealth. So a 300% return, net of all fees over 16 years. Where we sit today, and this is what I'm going to talk about, um, <coughs> In the next part of the presentation, we believe that that line's going to steepen over the next 16 years. Uh, we think that um, there's a, uh, a great opportunity for real estate um, and uh, the reallocation of capital that's occurring across economies with societal changes. So leading up into COVID, there are a number of um, predefined themes, and I, I watched some of the previous speakers, and they've mentioned a whole range of things, but there's nothing groundbreaking here. All these themes are really well understood. Um, <clears throat> there's nothing new in this, so we've got ageing populations. Demographic change with increased life expectancy. Uh, we've got falling home ownership rates. 
um, right around the world, particularly in developed countries that have been following for decades. It's nothing new there. This is a defined trend that's been occurring for a long period of time. And the take up and rise of e-commerce, clearly um, that is well understood by all. So we had a range of these predefined trends that were affecting real estate. And um, going into COVID and post-COVID, there's a number of newer emerging trends that are coming out, such as decentralisation, the move away from dense urban locations to less, less dense urban locations, and the increased adoption of remote working practices. Now, within that, like all sectors, if you think about it from a real estate perspective, these changes have got some major considerations that are occurring um, across um, global economies. So these, these themes are changing the way we live. There's societal change going on, where the way we're living and working and playing is different, right? So that's causing these massive reallocations of capital across global economies. And that's um, got some major implications for real estate. Now, on the negative side, and Greg mentioned um, some of them, with regards to shopping malls and the adoption of e-commerce, uh, as um, a true competitor, and it is a true competitor, and malls, shopping malls, not only in Australia but globally, are being disrupted, and they'll continue to be disrupted. They no longer serve the purpose they did previously uh, in society. And um, if we look at 2020, online sales in Australia's percentage of total retail sales have reached 30%. Now, once we normalise post-vaccines, whenever that's going to be, we think that'll drop a little bit, but the growth path is very, very strong. So, yes, shopping malls are disrupted. Same with high-rise office buildings, particularly with this new emerging trend of uh, remote working, as well as that decentralisation theme that I mentioned, the move away from dense urban locations to less dense urban locations. But however... Uh, if we look at, think about these, we refer to them as these old world type traditional assets that were benefiting in the way we used to live, work and play, that is such a small component of the real estate sector. Overridingly, the real estate sector is a massive beneficiary from these billions of dollars that are being reallocated across global economies with these societal changes. And the beneficiaries, and I've listed them there in green, Logistical warehousing, manufactured housing, detached housing, medical office buildings, private hospitals, data centres, biotech laboratories. Right throughout 2020, sitting here today, I'll describe the fundamentals, the operating fundamentals of all those asset types as extraordinarily strong and getting stronger. This is our portfolio, uh, <coughs> effectively sitting here today. And I just want to um, run through some aspects to it. And you can see there's a third of our portfolio sitting in residential. So and you think, why, why are they investing in residential assets? Well, there are a number of themes going on, broader themes. And like I said, household ownership rates have been falling for decades now across developed countries. Our rental pools are increasing. You know, most Australians probably wouldn't be aware that almost a third of Australian households rent. At its most extreme is Berlin, where 70% of households rent. The aspiration to own a house is no longer there like with previous generations. Our newer generations are valuing things differently. Societal change is taking place. We're adopting technologies. We're living differently. We've got different preferences to what we did before. And um, I think low interest rates and house price inflation has created some fairly material affordability issues as well. So these particular assets across manufactured housing, detached housing and apartments, and with regards to our apartment exposures, it's suburban, it's low rise, it's medium density with a low price rental point. Our residential portfolio throughout 2020 was over 95% occupied with rent collections of over 99%. During the good times when economies are expanding, employment's going up, wages growth is occurring, household incomes are going up, households can afford to pay more rent. The landlords put up rents, they collect more revenue, improves their operating margins. During the tougher times, economies shrink, unemployment rises, wages growth stagnates, and the renter puts off the decision to go and buy. Occupancies remain very high, like our portfolio, over 95% over the last 12 months, <clears throat> and maintain very secure cash flows. These assets 
um, ride through economic cycles and continue to generate cash and continue to generate earnings growth. So our portfolio is extraordinarily well placed for that particular theme. That's a third of our portfolio. You can see the next 25% is actually logistical warehousing. With these societal changes, these reallocation of global capital that I spoke about, the amount of money going into modernising supply chains is just enormous. It's billions and billions of dollars. And it's only just started, right? If you think the first iPhone was only launched, what, 13 odd years ago, we're in the very early stages. I mean, we've got some pretty material changes as the society, the way we're going to live, work and play into the future in adopting these technologies and these conveniences. So e-tailers, retailers, omnichannel retailers, wholesalers are, wholesalers are all trying to modernise their supply chains. It's attracting billions of dollars. Sitting here today and right throughout 2020 in my career, and I've been doing this for over 25 years, I've never seen tenant demand as high as, as, high as it is today in logistical warehousing. To give you an idea, I'll, I'll describe the fundamentals as extraordinarily strong. Market rental growth continued right throughout COVID. It didn't miss a beat. Occupancies increased, operating margins increased, dividends increased, cash came in. And this theme, like I said, is just early days. This isn't it, that none of these themes are short term. This isn't, uh, let's look out one or two or three years over the medium term and think, oh, what'll be the next thing? These themes are gonna cross decades. So they're very strong structural changes that are occurring place in, in our modern societies. And you can see the next component there really drops off uh, into healthcare. So our exposures are via acute care hospitals, post-acute care facilities and outpatient facilities as well as seniors housing, mainly independent living facilities. And what COVID has done with regards to governments focusing on fit for purpose healthcare systems it meant that there's going to be an enormous amount of capital going into the healthcare systems globally over the next 10 to 20 years. And just about every government globally is running a fiscal deficit. In fact, I'll go one step further. I can't think of one government globally that's not running a fiscal deficit. Taxpayers can't afford the billions of dollars required to modernise health systems globally. They're going to be relying on the private sector through public-private partnerships and attracting, in, putting high incentives on to attract private capital into the, into the healthcare industry. And real estate is extraordinarily well placed for that particular theme. And we think there's gonna be a lot of opportunity over the next 20, 10 to 20 years um, with regards to healthcare. The rest of our exposures via sector, really very diversified from their end, from hotels, which aren't structurally challenged, but sure, there's some short-term economic implications associated with closed borders and airline travel and tourism, et cetera. However, the valuations are very appealing for assets that aren't structurally challenged. Self-storage, self-storage occupancies through 2020 through today are up. Rates are up, cash flows are up, operating margins are up. Fundamentals are very strong. They're a second derivative of the housing market. We look at the east coast of the housing market um, as you know, fundamentally fairly strong. Australia is not unique. Every major country around the world, every major city around the world has experienced housing price inflation. So that phenomenon is really quite strong for self-storage and data centres clearly there with the drive, take up of internet and uh, e-commerce. So when I um, drew the, showed you that chart of our returns, longer term returns over 16 years, and we had that sloping line going up, that 300% return, where we sit to the day, today and our positioning, the team is pretty excited with these reallocations of capital that are occurring, the opportunities for the real estate sector are enormous. So we actually think that that line is going to steepen over the next 16 years. I just wanted to leave you with um, one image. So at the beginning of this presentation, I said, we invest in high quality assets located in the world's most bustling cities. This is one of our logistics investments in Yokohama, south of Tokyo in Japan, to give you an idea of the new age assets that we're investing in, not old world office buildings and shopping malls. And with that, I'd like to leave it there. Thank you all, and I'll pass it on to next speaker. Thanks, Stephen. Really good insights. Um, 
So uh, we're going to move now from, I guess, uh, G REITs, a global property, uh, and I'm going to pass over to Jan uh, in a second. And so uh, Jan is a portfolio manager at uh, Resolution Capital's Real Asset Strategy. So uh, prior to uh, being the portfolio manager there, Jan uh, was uh, with Resolution Capital in the broader, uh, broad, broader team. Um, the, the real asset strategy, some of the uniqueness of it is how broad the mandate is. And I think one of the benefits of that is it actually allows Jan to give us some really good insights, not only again uh, with A REITs, so Australian uh, property, but also infrastructure as well, because the strategy allows them to pull very different levers to give us a portfolio that can adapt in different kind of investment environments. So without that, I'll uh, pass over to Jan. Thanks for that introduction. Look, let's cut to the chase. I mean, why should you care about listed real assets? We believe that real assets are fundamentally pretty, pretty simple businesses. They're backed by tangible assets and produce long duration cash flows. So in that sense, they're a good complement to your uh, equities portfolio and in general store of wealth. So today I would like to discuss three things. The listed real asset opportunity set, our portfolio positioning, followed by three stock stories. But first, very short introduction to Resolution Capital. We have been investing our clients' money into a REIT for over 25 years. We've seen different cycles throughout. So what really stands uh, clear to us is that if you own good quality assets, keep your leverage low, and have capable aligned management, over time you generate good returns. But if one or more of these aspects are not available, your returns can be impaired. As you can see here, the strategy has evolved over time. In 2005, we added the option to uh, invest in GREITs to the, to the portfolio, which was really uh, beneficial to our clients when the GFC hit and some of the AREITs domestically came unstuck due to too much uh, leverage. More recently, we added infrastructure to the mix, again to increase resilience and improve returns. And hopefully the table here kind of proved this point. So when I say real assets, you probably think office buildings, shopping centers, airports, toll roads, and obviously that is correct. But it's broader than that. It also includes pubs, petrol stations, childcare centers, data centers, and also the poles and wires to, uh, to distribute electricity. So why is that important? Look, a broad opportunity set is important because that way we can allocate money where we see the best opportunities and just stay away from those sectors where we think returns are likely not to be very good. So if we look at standalone A REITs, look, we think it's too concentrated. Three sectors make up the bulk of the sector. And it's kind of a similar story for, for infrastructure. And there the names are even less. I mean, it's less than two handful. But the quality of infrastructure the available domestically is actually very high. I mean, if you compare Transurban, NextDC, APA, or Sydney Airport, these are really high quality companies also in a global context. So we believe when you blend these two asset classes, you get a much more robust opportunity set particularly if you add uh, global GREITs and global listed infrastructure to the mix. As kind of highlighted before, COVID did uh, um, change the sector fortunes between the different sectors quite dramatically. I think it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Look, I think at least the good news is that the companies were in, in good financial shape pre-COVID. So hence, they didn't really need to raise that much uh, uh, equity at all, um, particularly for the ARIES, that, that, that was a good, uh, good outcome. They have learned the lessons from the GFC. On the other side, infrastructure did raise a bit of money. The Sydney Airport and Auckland Airport both raised uh, money for, I think, obvious uh, reasons. The fund had little exposure prior to the equity raising, but did take opportunity to, uh, to uh, participate in, in the raisings. When looking at real assets, there's a few different buckets how we look at it. 
I mean, you have the, the stable companies or even the companies who thrive during COVID, such as logistics, supermarkets, childcare, data centers, they did all really well. The other ones were the companies which were impacted quite dramatically, retail, also airports, a very obvious one, and toll roads. So we believe these companies will be beneficiaries when, when the life returns to, to normal with uh, the vaccine use, uh, with the vaccines rolling out. And the final bucket is the decarbonization trend, which is gonna be with us for the next couple of decades. So fossil fuel generation will retire. It will be filled up with uh, new uh, renewables in very different locations, so that they need to be hooked up into the grid. Plus the grid needs to be, become a lot more uh, resilient. So therefore, like we need more transmission lines as well. So how does this come into uh, our portfolio? Well, first of all, maybe tell you what doesn't come into the portfolio, companies with significant coal exposure because we just find it too difficult to, to know what coal demand is gonna be in, let's say a decade's time in a world which wants to decarbonize. You see one of the biggest uh, uh, parts of the portfolio is logistics. Goodman Group is, a, is an important part here. Look, we all know that e-commerce has grown. Companies wanna increase the resilience of the supply chain as well. And it's difficult to see a company better positioned than Goodman Group globally to profit from this trend through A, its development uh, capabilities, and B, its fund management platform. However, I should acknowledge that a significant portion of Goodman's earnings are of a non-recurring nature, nature, hence they're just more risky. Hence the portfolio also has exposure to, for example, US REIT Prologis, which has the majority of its income from rental income. Then moving to retail. At the beginning of the year, the, uh, the portfolio did not have a lot of exposure to retail. But during 2020, we have increased it. Look, a, a number of retail categories actually have been COVID winners. For example, like supermarkets have done really well. Large uh, format retail uh, also. But the portfolio also, also owns Centre Group, which owns big shopping centers with apparel. And clearly they were impacted when lockdown uh, rules came into place and footfall dropped significantly and uh, as did sales. As a consequence, rent collection fell. But we have seen when lockdowns have eased uh, during 2020 that rental collection has decreased significantly. For example, for Center Group, it has been uh, 93% in the second half. Look, what we see is a consumer which is in general a very good state. I mean, savings rates haven't been this high in decades, so we believe there's quite a bit of pent-up demand. And we wouldn't be surprised if some of these uh, rental levels get back to pre-COVID levels very rapidly. We cannot say this, that it's gonna be afterwards, like that, that retail is, 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 is normal. We do believe it's gonna be a lower growth uh, sector going forward, but I do, do think there's quite a bit of upside uh, in, in terms of earnings uh, in, the, in the coming years. Maybe a sector you're not overly familiar with, the three Ns and the triple net sector. That means it's net of maintenance, capex, insurance, and tax. In short, like the tenant pays for that, not the landlord. If you combine this with a really long lease, it means very high cash conversion. And I think that's, a, that's an aspect that many investors underestimate. So that's a sector we like. I will highlight Arena Reader's childcare company later on. Toll roads. Look, you might not be familiar that like uh, for Transurban, it's concessions have the option that they can increase their tolls by the greater of 4.5% or CPI. Hence, if CPI comes back, we believe that's a good, uh, good inflation hedge. And finally, the airports, which were of course one of the big COVID losers. Historically, airports have been great investments as rising population growth and especially an increasing middle class have increased travel. Auckland Airport is, is in our opinion, extremely well positioned. It owns, first of all, it's a freehold uh, uh, estate, owns a lot of land, and it's actually one of the biggest logistics developers in New Zealand. And that income was very uh, welcome during the pandemic. Um, second of all, like I mean, it's extremely geared towards the Asian consumer. So once 
the borders are open, and they will at some point, we expect the travel to be back very rapidly. You can see that in New Zealand, domestic travel has already recovered quite significant, despite occasional lockdowns. Qantas has been uh, accepting uh, international fares for, of uh, bookings uh, from October. And even if that proves to be optimistic and it's going to be half a year later, look, it doesn't really impact uh, the valuation of the stock, in our opinion. Moving to a very different type of company. This is a US data center company. Well, we all know that data center growth uh, has grown a lot uh, the last couple of years. So in our opinion, you want to have companies which have a strong development capability because that's what the real juice is as these companies get a double digit return on capital when they build new centers. So we believe Switch is very good at it. Actually, they allege that uh, next this year uh, has just copied um, uh, their patents uh, here in, in, uh, in Australia. And also very importantly, they can finance that growth internally through returned earnings. So this company hasn't raised any equity since it's listed in 17. And also what is kind of unique is the very low tenant churn, like less than 1% of customers leave every year, which kind of indicates that they must be doing something right. Final company, Arena Read. Look, I wish there were more companies like this. It's a very simple business model. Majority of its rental income comes from uh, childcare, leased to operators for, for a long period of time. Leases are triple net. So this company is profiting from population growth and uh, increased female uh, work participation. It has shown really good uh, earnings growth uh, over, over a long period of time and we expect more of that to come in, in the future. So to wrap it all up, we believe like listed real asset is a combination of companies, stable companies which continue to do really well and some uh, vaccine uh, recovery beneficiaries. The sector in general is in good, uh, good state, like leverage is, is low, like management teams are focused. The distribution yield of the portfolio is, is low 4%, but we expect this to, to grow significantly in the coming years as earnings increase and some of, for example, the, the airports reinstate the dividend. And also, we believe that listed is trading, generally speaking, at a discount to unlisted. So before I give you back to, uh, to Greg, I would like to say, look, if you want to know more about uh, listed real asset, we put a lot of effort in our uh, quarterly report where we give our uncensored views on what's happening in the, in the sector. So please have a look at the website if you want to have more information. Thank you. Oh, that's fine. I'll, I'll stand. They can kind of sit. We'll go to that. So, so just on time, we're on um, 10.35 now. Toby, do, do, we'll, we've got kind of some prepared questions and then... Yep. So, over to you. Six or seven minutes. Yep. Okay. Cool. So, we will. We've got uh, kind of five pre-prepared questions. And if anyone has any kind of questions that relate to any of those presentations, just probably pop up your hand and Toby will... Um, Toby will grab you, yeah. So uh, just quickly, uh, you know, if we think about, you know, the really, really uh, short term, uh, the first question I had is kind of, you know, when we look at infrastructure as well as kind of property, we've been in this very different investment environment of kind of falling rates. And Stephen, as you said, like clearly we see the Australian property market and when interest rates come down, property just does sensationally well. Um, but the last couple of weeks and probably the last month, we've seen this kind of reversal. So interest rates globally going up, a lot of talk about this kind of reflation trade um, and potentially inflation coming back. So that leads through to a couple of dynamics. Firstly, I, th I think, you know, when you look at infrastructure, people call it, you know, like a bond proxy. Um, in an environment where bonds are doing pretty bad, how do you kind of think about your assets? And then secondly, if we are going to get this inflationary outcome, uh, you know, how, how do we think the assets will, will uh, uh, perform in that type of scenario? So I might... Stephen, do you want to answer that first and then Jan? Yeah, sure. Uh, firstly, am I on or...? No, I don't think so. Am I on? Great. Yep. <laughs> Great. Sorry about that. 
Um, I think firstly from an inflationary expectations point of view, uh, I can tell you from, you know, I, I, I um, champion our macroeconomic forecasting on behalf of our team and I've seen no inflation, real inflation, come through any economy globally. It's not to say that that won't happen. Uh, and when we talk about inflation, it's really easy to confuse inflationary expectations with real inflation and, and implication for, for bond rates. But the reality is we're talking about consumer inflation. And the majority of inflation that has come through globally in most developed and developing uh, economies is cost push, right? So your, your children's education costs are going up, your insurance costs are going up, your energy costs are going up, but are you paying more for your typical goods, your consumer goods that you buy? And the answer is no. And that's because of the internet. It's the most transparent marketplace in human history. You can compare any good or service just about right around the world. It's taken away pricing power, pricing power for services and goods. So the only way that corporates can compete is through modernising supply chains and all those things that I sort of alluded to in the presentation. Um, if we do start to see some inflationary expectations going through with um, you know, extraordinary high levels of fiscal stimulus, uh, you know, central bank policies that are extraordinarily aggressive, including our own RBA that's entered into a quantitative easing program. For those that saw the announcement yesterday, they just upped their buying of five-year bonds. That is flooding markets full of cash. If we do see an inflationary response from that, that will have implications for the longer end of the curve, I think, and for bond rates to maybe to continue to sell off. But where they sit at the moment is at extraordinary low levels. And I wouldn't know of any fund manager, probably speaker, that's going to speak today that would be, use spot bond rates to value out equities or investments, financial assets. Nobody does it. Because as you approach zero, if you think, ECB's euro bonds are negative, right? As you approach negative, you've got infinity. You can't divide anything to infinity. So no, one, no one's using those low interest rates anyway. Uh, I, I think as um, central banks manage their aggressive policies going forward, that they'll likely normalise interest rates at some point in the future. It's just hard to know when. But I think we're all... Most pundits are fairly well on a consensus that it's going to take a long period of time. You know, we just can't afford for the amount of asset price and inflation that it's occurred through global economies for an extended period of time now with very low interest rates to all of a sudden revert in a short period of time. It would, believe me, if that occurred, we wouldn't have an inflation problem. We'd all be in deep recession. And like I sort of alluded to, on. My presentation, every, every government globally is running a fiscal deficit. So, um, you know, that every government owes money. N none of them is in a net asset position. So uh, I'm not overly concerned about inflationary expectations. I think if they were to come through, well, that's positive for real estate. They're a fantastic inflationary hedge. So, um, you know, we're pretty comfortable where valuations sit today and I don't see it as a material risk. Um, yeah, look, I think history has been very inconclusive of what the impact is on uh, of inflation on, on, on property. Look, if it comes through a stronger economy, then uh, property should be a beneficiary. <coughs> so and I think in, in, in terms of infrastructure, it's, it's not too dissimilar. I mean, if you have a fixed rate, uh, fixed increases, which would be less than CPI, sure, that, that would mean not a good outcome, but very few of none of my companies would, would have that. So, I mean, there is a... Uh, there's an inflation link. Uh, look, maybe short term, like there will be a little bit of impact uh, if, uh, from on all equities if uh, if that happens. But I think longer term, look, it's it's it's, it's pretty marginal. Yep. Okay. Very good. So, question number two, just in terms of the, you know, and I alluded to it before, just the structural, um, uh, the structural problems in both, I guess, office. If we can kind of focus in on office at the moment, so you do get this. Call it the Zoom effect, you know. And I think we're kind of sitting here and then in a year, you know, we've had the vaccine rollout and you'll be back to normal. So one of the things a lot of our investment committees are thinking is, well, what, how, how much damage has actually 
uh, occurred in that office um, space. So, I mean, and that could be very different Australia and globally. So, do you want to each kind of talk to, to that uh, sector kind of specifically? I think it's important to break it up into two components. Firstly, you've got short-term economic disruption associated with social distancing measures, you know, where people couldn't go to the office, right? So they've got that implications, which got implications for, you know, CBD-based tenants, all the services that hang off those, you know, those office building tenants, cafes, restaurants, those sorts of things. And then you've got the long-term structural impact, who I think that you're referring to, Greg, uh, and you refer to it as a Zoom effect, I think it's very real. I think, you know, no longer do, does a, a fund manager like ourselves need to be in a building beside a stockbroker or beside uh, the legal fraternity or beside the accounting fraternity. You know, we, we no longer, the way we operate as a world, go and deliver documents between each other. It doesn't happen. If I want to meet with any of those other professionals, I can do it via those technologies that we've all been adopting and work somewhat successfully. So I think there is real disruption to, co to occur within high-rise CBD locations and I would say most CBDs right around the world are going to incur land price deflation, deflation over time because of that. In saying that, we can't generalise. There's going to be a lower natural level of tenant demand, lower occupancy, higher incentives, falling rents, but at some point, if the market remains disciplined and we don't build buildings and we've got natural commerce growth, the CBDs may naturally fill up over a very long period of time. But there's definitely a structural headwind. Collaboration's important. Do you need to be on the 20th floor of a 1,000 square metre floor plate with another 100 people five days a week to collaborate? Well, I don't. Maybe others do. In fact, I don't think it's a very good environment to collaborate in anyway. What's happened with rising um, land prices over the last 20 years is that as modern buildings got built, they needed higher rents to justify the building, so they're cramming more people in. So now, for an average uh, floor plate in Australia, you've got down to one, one employee per, ter per 10 square metres. That's 100 employees per, per 1,000 square metres. So we're open planned, we're hot desking, there's no privacy, so you can do all the collaboration you want, but the reality is do you get much benefit from that? I think there has to be an element of that. If you look to the tech companies, the most successful companies in the world, they don't operate in high-rise CBD buildings, they're in large campuses, large floor plates with huge amenities, lots of collaboration space, lots of innovation space, they don't wear fancy ties and suits and, and leather pants. They do things very differently and they do it very successfully. So I would say that the finance sector, which is historically very, very conservative, if I look at what I'm wearing now, the only difference would be to 100 years ago, I'd probably have a hat on. Right? We, we've been very slow to change, but I think it will happen over time. So I think they, long term there's a structural disruption to occur. Yeah. Look, I don't think the office is dead by, uh, by any measure, but obviously it will. It has to, has to change. So, I mean, and people like I me mean, don't want to be, like at least personally, I don't want to be behind Zoom the whole whole day. So, I mean, look, so I find this today quite, uh, quite a, nice, a nice change. Um, but obviously we are going to a hybrid model, but we do want to have like different kind of office space, like as Stephen mentioned, like a lot more collaboration space. I mean, the whole densification movement over the last couple of years is probably dead. But I mean, it, it, but it's fair to say. Look, I mean, uh, that that short term, this is a, this is not a positive. It will take some some time to kind of work through uh, through the markets. So I will get the tap on the hand. We'll we'll have one more question. So we're happy to have um, one question from the floor, and then we'll um, have morning tea. Just following on from that discussion. Do you see that the collaboration spaces that may survive or even emerge under the hybrid model, and I think you know, that's probably going to happen, might be more regional? So do you see a move away from you know, everyone having to be in Sydney or Brisbane or Melbourne and, and, and having a more regional focus on you know, lifestyle and um, people being able to live very comfortably, for instance, in some other area that's not necessarily Parramatta or Sydney CBD? I don't know about rural. I mean, I think it would be a great, great thing for our country if that was to occur because, uh, you know, our rural um, towns have been suffering for decades and they only continue to suffer as this whole urbanisation, all the jobs are in the cities. It would be nice to see that revert. 
Um, I think there might be an element of that around the coast, and I think, I mean, I'm not an expert on the coast, coastal towns of Queensland, but I do know the New South Wales coastal towns, and their house price inflation over the last 12 months has well exceeded Sydney. Um, as you've had a lot of these sea changes bring that decision to relocate quicker, and you've had younger generations who can take a city job and do it fully remotely in certain industries like IT. Uh, I've seen quite a bit of that. So there may be an, an, an element of that. I think probably will, what will occur is, if you think you're a corporate and you've got your, your leasing space in, in the centre of the Brisbane CBD in a nice shiny building, the CEO, the average, for a service-based business in, um, in a CBD right around the globe, the average occupancy cost is 8%. In some instances, you can move to a lower rise, very modern building on the fringe of the city on suburban locations. And there's quite a, a number of um, these um, suburban locations popping up where you can reduce the rents by up to half. So I think there's a big economic incentive to move away from CBDs. And I think that there probably will be, there'll be an element of that from decentralisation. It'd be nice if it was gonna go the next stage to true de-urbanisation from cities to rural areas. Um, but, you know, I'm a bit more sceptical that that's going to occur, um, maybe over the very longer term. Newcastle house prices are up over 20% in 12 months. So you've had the first spike. Whether that continues on, um, we are embracing technology. We're doing things differently. We're going to continue to do it do things differently in the future. A lot of it's electronic. Anyone that's going to buy a house in the next few years probably won't meet with their lawyers in someone else's lawyer's office, settle with the bankers, hand over the and exchange contracts. That doesn't happen anymore, right? We do virtual auctions if we want to do them now and we settle everything electronically. So you don't really need to be in physical places so much anymore. So. Yeah. I'm a, I think decentralisation is going to occur. How far it occurs over what time frames, the, the jury's still yeah. out. Mm. Yeah. Look, look, personally, I think, look, I mean, there's a good reason the cities were there to begin with, right? I mean, you had a lot of different skill sets. You have fantastic infrastructure. So, I mean, to, to necessarily have done the, the de decentralised office building just because the boss lives there and you have to go, like, pretty, pretty difficult to get there, I'm not, not, not certain then, like, particularly not in the... the, uh, the, the the, the really kind of raw places. Yep. Yeah, I think that's right. <clears throat> um, actually, reminds me of a joke about infrastructure, and I was going to tell it. Uh, it's just a joke about Queensland infrastructure, but then I decided not to tell it because I thought only Brisbane people would get it. So that that is that is a joke. All the infrastructures in Brisbane. So it's exactly what Jan said. The poor North Queensland people, or. Uh, you know, Newcastle, they just don't get the same kind of level of infrastructure spend. Um, not, a, not a great joke, but <laughs> <coughs> clearly we're all capital city people here. So I'll pass back to Alan and um, I think we'll break for morning tea. You know, pass back.